Good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Jensen, and I'm Director of Writing Programs at ASU. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our second event in the 2021-2022 Tomorrow Talks series. Tomorrow Talks place thought leaders of today in conversation with the change makers of tomorrow, our students. Each distinguished speaker will explain how they use writing to address our world's most pressing challenges. This year, the series celebrates women in science, and in addition to our guest this evening, Meg Lohman, we hosted primatologist Jane Goodall last November, and will host social scientist Pradeesh Madhavi later this March. Tomorrow Talks are a student engagement initiative led by the Division of Humanities in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at ASU, and hosted by ASU's Department of English in partnership with Macmillan Publishers. Meg Lohman, our guest this evening, is one of the world's foremost canopy researchers. She serves as executive director and founder of the Tree Foundation in Sarasota, Florida. Since 2000, this nonprofit has linked local underserved children to nature and promoted tree research, education, and exploration. She is also launching Mission Green, a project to build 10 canopy walkways in the world's highest biodiverse forests over the next five years. She is the author of the book we will be discussing this evening, The Arbor Knot, which I encourage you to get, which she wrote to, in part to inspire girls to seek careers in field biology. She currently serves as visiting professor for, national, for the National University of Singapore, research professor for the University of Sands, Malaysia, adjunct professor at Arizona Uni State University, and National Geographic Explorer in Ethiopia. Today, Dr. Lohman will be in conversation with my colleague, Dr. Joni Adamson, who is a President's Professor of English and Distinguished Scholar in the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at ASU. Professor Adamson is founding director of the flagship hub of UNESCO's Bridges program. Bridges is the first humanities-led international sustainability coalition working to achieve social justice and environmental transition in the United Nations Decade of Action from 2020 to 2030. Please be in welcoming Drs. Meg Lohman and Joni Adamson. Thank you so much, Kyle. Okay. Um, so welcome to Arizona State University, where you have many adoring fans and uh, from your previous lectures and engagements, and we're proud to call you a member of our faculty. So if everyone has not um, noticed that before, uh, please note that she is a member of our faculty. And we're meeting tonight on lands situated on the homelands of many indigenous people, including the Akimel and uh, Autumn and Peeposh people, and we want to acknowledge and pay respects to Indigenous elders, past, present, and future, as ongoing custodians of these lands today and throughout the generations. So tonight we're thrilled to be meeting with a pioneering woman canopy scientist to talk about trees and forests and to think about her book, The Arbor Knot, which I just want to, to, to say right up front, was so inspiring to read. Um, it's just amazing the things that you've ma managed to do around the world and accomplish around the world. And so it's just such a pleasure and an honor to be here talking with you about the book. Um, in the book, um, Dr. Meg Lohman reminds us that forests literally clean our water, provide our oxygen, and provide the habitat for over half of Earth's terrestrial biodiversity, including the vast numbers of insects so critical to planetary health. So you are, um, I, I want to say about the books too, that I was so impressed that the book is both lyrical, poetic, and scientific as you document how critical forests and individual trees themselves are for mitigating climate warming as they uh, store vast amount of carbons. So tonight in this uh, tomorrow talk, uh, we wanna focus on the ways that writing um, helps us address some of our, our most pressing challenges. And I would also add that it's, I think we're, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking as well about the ways in which your book and this book in particular, um, shows us how writing can be empowering. So let's start with a question about your writing as a form of empowerment for yourself and for others. 
and as you address the planetary problems of, of deforestation mainly. And I'd like to put the question in the context of the humanities, as you as you saw from our from the video we just watched. Uh, the humanities it, um, is um, we're all part of a humanities um, department, and so we like to think about the humanities and the arts quite often. And I want to put your book into the context of the humanities and arts, which offer writing teachers so much good material to help their students think about their own writing. So in the last decade, we've seen both novelists and filmmakers turn to trees and make them actual characters. Um, <laughs> even the stars of the show, so to speak, from James Cav Cameron's Avatar, um, in which he uh, depicts a character which is called the home tree, which is a mother tree. Um, and uh, to Richard Powers' Mimas, which is a giant sequoia, um, in which um, two activists camp out for about two weeks. Now, when I heard that you were coming uh, to speak at ASU, I was so thrilled because uh, I study women scientists in literature and film that are working on trees. <laughs> so oh. anyway, your book is just such an inspiration for those characters. And so, um, so that's what I, that's the sort of context that I want to put this first question in. Um, both Cameron and um, Powers imagine their primary scientists as female. And it seems that Powers at least has your work in mind, at least that's what I would argue. <laughs> and also your colleagues, other women who are biologists and dendrologists. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, why it was so important for you to keep a journal it, you've clearly kept a journal, a really detailed journal. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about how long you've been keeping the journal and how the journal contributed to this book and why it's so important for women scientists like yourself to tell their stories, even perhaps write a memoir like yours um, and why that's so important um, for all of the women coming up in the profession. Okay, thanks, Joni, so much. Well, first of all, I love that video. I think I'd like to come back to ASU and be a humanities major. It was really inspiring. It was so much fun, and it put writing in a great context. I have to admit, in the world of science, I'm a complete geek, and I don't think we probably ever were told that we should write for the effects of communicating to the public. public. So I think a lot of scientific writing is quite exclusive and that might have hurt issues like climate change over the years and conservation simply because the scientific community wasn't really focused on informing the public. They were more focused on informing each other. And I did keep a journal for most of my life, I think back I actually wrote a little children's book when I was about 11 years old. I only just published it a few years ago. I actually self-published it because it was just fun to think about how I spent my childhood watching birds and drawing pictures and doing this and that. Um, but I really did start keeping a journal when I worked away from home and I wanted to come home and tell my mom and dad what I was really doing. And I was more serious about the journal when I started going overseas for field research because I'm embarrassed to admit, but in my day, there was an internet when I went off to graduate school and there was very expensive use of payphones, but not too many payphones in tropical rainforests. So I kept journals so that I could return home eventually and then remind myself of the stories and adventures to share with my family and friends. And ironically, I did keep those journals. I have a big closet full. And when I did decide to write a memoir, it was so wonderful to have those journals. So I tell every student, um, keep a journal. And even though you might not do it every single day, sometimes I would write something really small, like the smells of New Delhi or the feeling of climbing that first tree or welding my first slingshot. And it would immediately bring back the memory of the whole day. So that was really fun. Um, and why did I write a memoir? I guess, you know, it meant a lot to me to think if I could do something to help 
other women as well as young men to go into their careers. I feel that my book is full of my misadventures as I call them. So many hurdles, so many things that I probably didn't do well at because I was tripping over crazy things like the fact that girls shouldn't do science. And so in the end, if my book can be helpful to others as a roadmap about how to pursue things better, how to find your passion in your career, then I'll be really, really happy with that as one of the main reasons to write a memoir like this. One of the things I was so impressed about with your book was the fact that you came up with a plan for your last 5,000 days. <laughs> and I have colleagues here at ASU, women colleagues at, at ASU, who also have plans like this, plans for the last five years or plans for the last 10 years. And it's such a good idea. And the book was itself part of the plan for the last 5,000 days. And um, so I just wanted you to know that I was so impressed with that plan, plan for the last 5,000 days, but also that this book came out of, out of your plan for the last 5,000 days. Oh, I'm so glad. And, you know, part of that problem was I looked around at my world of forest conservation. Do you know, in my lifetime, half of the world's forests have been cut down and maybe you're just a little bit younger. I'm not sure. But so our track record is so dreadful. And I have to say that in science, of course, we're trained to publish and collect numbers, but we're not really trained to save forests. And we don't get promoted by saying, well, what, there were 100 hectares that I saved down in the Amazon. We get promoted for the numbers in the publications. And so I thought maybe in my last 5,000 days, I need to really focus on how can I give back to society with all of the scientific knowledge that I have. So that was kind of where that 5,000 days came from. Well, we're very, we're very grateful for your 5,000 days. And like I, said, <laughs> I, I see, I see your work trickling into the arts and the humanities where students in composition classes will be, um, you know, benefiting from the characters that are coming out of, out of the work that's based, uh, or the characters that are based on your work. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more as, as we go forward. Your book um, is so interesting to read because when you started out, you looked around and you saw no women role models. Um, as, as for, for the kinds of things that you wanted to do in science. But very early in your life, um, you became fascinated with the ways that Harriet Tubman um, led enslaved peoples through the forest at night as she literally felt the mosses growing on trees. Um, and in a, in a sense, you, you point out, she was kind of like reading the mosses. And that became a kind of inspiration for you. Um, you even say that a person who can read the mosses is called a bryologist. And so before there was the word bryologist, there was this woman, Harriet Tubman, who um, was reading the mosses as a way to offer freedom for you know, people who were trying to um, you know, gain their freedom. And you also evoke Rachel Carson as a model uh, for women in science and for your own love of birds, which were your co companions up in the trees. Um, so can you speak a little bit about the importance of role models um, and you know, why the importance of role models is one of the strongest themes of your memoir? Um, today, you're numbered among the, the women, including Sylvia Earle, who writes the forward to your book, who are considered the role models. So I'd just like to hear you uh, talk a little bit about why it's so important for people going into the sciences to have those role models. Sure. And it's embarrassing for me to admit, but I didn't really know that women could become scientists because I didn't have any living role models I had a little job um, shelving books in the public library after school in seventh and eighth grade. And that's where I got a hold of the biography of Harriet Tubman and Red Silent Spring. And I was so blown away by these women who were deceased, unfortunately, but they just really inspired me. And I always had male science teachers. I never, ever had a female science teacher, even in college. And I did, of course, go to a college that was primarily male in the year 
years before me. And so all the professors were men. And when I got to Sydney University, as you know, for my graduate scholarship, the head of the department brought me aside and very kindly said, why are you doing this? You'll only get married and have children. So again, I felt very uncomfortable that I had no women to talk to, to ask. And I just quietly and doggedly kept studying my leaves and my trees. So when I emerged as a you know, employed scientist, I just vowed that I would always be available for kids, especially girls, because I think it's really important to have somebody to ask questions to. And again, if I had had women, I think maybe I would have had a better ability to navigate some of the hurdles in my career. At least that's my um, thought for other women moving forward too. Well, again, it's my contention that it's that your work, you know, you went when you went up to the treetops for the first time, you know, there there weren't women arbonauts. No. And today we're seeing women scientists being de de depicted in films like Avatar and also in really important Pulitzer Prize winning novels like um, The Overstory. And it's even called The Overstory. Um, and I think that's really important. And I have, I, I brought a little illustration that I wanted Bruce to put up on the screen. And this is Nalini Netkarni. She's been a, a, a speaker here at ASU. She is one of your colleagues you've worked yes. with her. And she, you know, following in your footsteps or working alongside with you um, is also a canopy scientist. She works at the University of Utah, and um, she was able to talk with um, Mattel and get them to issue a canopy Barbie. And so, well, I'll correct you on that. In okay. actual fact, she she did that herself, and almost I that I heard got arrested by Mattel because she infringed on copyright. She made those herself. And finally, just a year or two ago, they just said, it's okay if you continue making those yourself. They were kind enough to realize that maybe it was okay for this lone woman to redo old Barbies and make them into science Barbies. Yeah. <laughs> so we love that. Bruce, if you can scroll down, keep scrolling down. Okay, so see, see now they've got a whole yep. bunch of women in science Barbies. Yay. <laughs> And it's, I was telling you, we had Legos too that came out that are women in science, which is awful cute. Um, and so um, Nalini Nidkarni, Dr. Nalini Nidkarni is working with um, National Geographic and they've issued this whole sort of series of women in science Barbies. And Nalini says ab about these Barbies, they're still, they're still, their body shape is still a problem. And the fact that they're made out of plastic is still a problem. But she, she argues that this is sort of an advancement, at least in, in representation, in a Mattel toy. Um, so I'm just convinced, you know, that the work that you and your colleagues like Nalini are doing is, is, is now finding its way into popular, popular culture, even Mattel toys, and, you know, into these films and these novels that I've mentioned. So thanks, thanks, Bruce. Thanks for putting that up on the screen. Um, so for women in academia in general, and especially for women in science, um, it's not, not necessarily been easy. It's definitely not been easy for you. And I have to say that um, I said this to you earlier, I felt a little bit like PTSD or something when I was reading <laughs> your book because because I know really very few women in academia that haven't encountered some of the issues that that you've encountered and it becomes really you know uh difficult to figure out how to negotiate diplomatically you know in the face of these kinds of issues that confront women so your sixth chapter is titled hitting the glass canopy how strangler figs and tall poppies taught me to survive as a woman, woman in science. And in this chapter, you discuss the challenges of being a single mom. Um, that was also me having PS, PTSD because yes, when you're a woman in academia with kids, um, 
you know, and you were committed as a woman to seeking equity well before the Me Too movement. But this book is coming out in this sort of, you know, um, milieu of the Me Too movement. And so that also makes it um, very interesting. You outline the many obstacles that you overcame, but the title of the book is real, or the title of the chapter is just so interesting. And, and can you talk a little bit about why strangler figs and uh, tall poppies? Because sure. oh. plants that help you figure out how to, how to navigate. Yeah, and first I'll just say from a writing perspective, I agonized about the fact that in most of my chapters of life, I had some hurdles with different kind of gender issues, the fact that I shouldn't be on an expedition or that, you know, I had... I married into a family that didn't want women to become scientists. I was very envious of Nalini actually, because she married a guy that loved her being a scientist and that was so great for her. Um, so all along I thought, okay, should I put these little stories and pepper them throughout the book or should I put it in one chapter? And I wanted to put it in one chapter in the end because I didn't want the book to be full of these negative issues about gender imbalance and inequity. So chapter six is a hot topic. And I will also admit that I never would have dared write this book 10 years ago. I would have feared that I would lose my job. There still are a predominance of male bosses in the world of science and in the world of awards and granting and everything else. So I would have been so frightened about bearing my soul the way I did in chapter six. But now that I'm kind of older and have perhaps less hanging over my head, I thought, you know what, I owe the women of the world to talk about these things. So that was how that chapter came to be. And when I did live in Australia, there was um, a botanical analogy, which I think is kind of cool. I think it's also true in Britain that they use a little phrase called the tall poppy syndrome. And that means when anybody gets good or better than the average, they get cut back just the same way you might clip a flower. And so that was very evident to me in Australia that it was important not to do better than the men or not to appear to do better than the men, which is very disappointing. And I certainly experienced that back in the States as well. And as I went to the forest so often for my solace and my kind of wonderful inspiration from the trees, I did come across my absolute favorite tree in the world, which is the strangler fig. And figs are a big family of trees found in almost every continent, which is really cool. And um, very, very important spiritually in places like India and Asia. And they also have, I think, the coolest strategy in the world. And that is that most strangler figs start life at the top. A bird poops out a seed on a branch and lo and behold the roots grow down from the top so this tree is guaranteed light and water which are the most important things for a tree to have meanwhile other species of trees are growing in the ground first struggling waiting for a little light fleck hoping to get enough water and of course the mortality is really huge so here's this cool strangler fig coming down from the top not only putting its roots in the ground leafing right away but then eventually Actually, even strangling its host in most cases because all of those roots surround the tree and I thought to myself, wow, if I had only known that as a female when I was younger, that I could be more strategic, look for the best resources, develop patterns in my career that would have really helped me be effective and efficient. I think I would have been a strangler fig and then maybe I could have overcome some of those male bosses along the way. So that was my analogy of two plants that really helped me figure out how I should behave as a woman in science. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think that that's such a, for, for me, that those are really um, interesting and provocative metaphors. And, and one of the reasons why I find your book to be really empowering as a, as a memoir, as, you know, by a woman in science, but also just as a woman in ac academia or just a woman in general um, and I think that um, the book is empowering in part because, you know, we can all read it. Well, yeah. and Joni, it was so embarrassing to write some of those things, I have to tell you. But I figured it was for the benefit of my girls that read it. I, that's what I mean. It's empowering because um, 
the Me Too movement says Me Too. And, you know, now with this empowering memoir, uh, you know, we can, readers can read this and say, how can we avoid these pitfalls? And, you know, I think that's one of the things we should all be striving for is to avoid those pitfalls um, going forward. Absolutely. And I am the mother of two boys, admittedly. So I think, you know, men too need to read about strategies and ways to do things better because women are not alone in this world of suffering against some prejudices in some places in work and in home life where things get a little tough. And it's, it's good to think harder about how we can solve them. Yeah. And to be fair, I'm very impressed by the way you gave such gracious and warm praise to all of the male mentors right yeah I really and of course that's all I had with a few exceptions one woman boss my whole career so I did have to say to myself you know what there were some really wonderful gentlemen out there and I'm so grateful that they imparted upon me some good values yeah E.O. Wilson Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm just still overcome because we've lost him in the last month and the last two years of his life. He was so gracious and adopted me a little bit. We had wonderful lunches together and plotted out um, the mission green, the last chapter in my book, which is a project that hopefully dispels some hope and comes up with ways that we might solve some of our issues of losing so much biodiversity. And I think maybe you and I will talk about that later in this discussion. Yes, we need to talk about those uh, UNESCO heritage sites, but that's for later. All right, so uh, just uh, a a sort of follow-up question to to this question. You know, we've we've talked about the strangler strangler, uh, banyan trees and the tall poppies, but one of the really important themes of your book is inclusion. And uh, it's really clear that you write the chapter to make the point that inclusion is so important. So inclusion and diversity is so important. So in the chapter that you call water bears and wheelchairs, <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful title, in part because water bears are tardigrades. Um, I think right you now, love them. <laughs> I love them too. <laughs> I just I just had so much fun every time, every time you said the word tardigrade, I was just like, yes. Um, but you write about how you're interested in making sure that all people, including people differently able, um, women, people of all groups, um, are able to get up into the canopy. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ways that the treetop walks that you've innovated through the years support, not only research those papers that you are, um, uh, mentioning earlier, just, you know, essays and research, but inclusion. Absolutely. Uh, inclusion. And yeah, I am so passionate about that. I think maybe because I was excluded for so many experiences in my career, everything from expeditions where I was the only woman to my first job interview in Australia where I was really, really qualified, but I was dismissed because I, they said no farmer's wife or mother of two boys could ever be a professor. So you're, you're not allowed to apply. So all those things made me determined that I would be different if I got a chance to be a leader in the field. And so I have mentored over the years, many, many um, Latino students and African-American students and um, girls, of course, in science, but it, dawned on me through personal um, experience in Florida, especially where we have a huge population of people in wheelchairs and people with walkers and, of course, moms with strollers, that there's a lot of people that have disabilities that keep them from being out in nature. And they're always the students um, who have physical disabilities that usually get told, well, you stay in the lab and take the notes and everyone else gets to go out on the field trip and have fun in the forest. And that just seemed really unfair. So I did team up with one of the world's few water bear experts um, from Kansas. We actually were grad students together in Australia and 
I was had the tree climbing methods and I adapted some things where we made pulleys and developed some methods where people without the use of their legs could get up the tree and do some exploration. And he, of course, helped with the laboratory experience of identifying what we saw. And we got National Science Foundation funding, I think because we applied three times and they were so tired of us. They said, just give them the money. And we spent five summers with every summer having physically uh, mobility limited students partnered with students that had no limitations and they would work as a team and all of them discovered new species of water bears were able to publish their data and it was really really empowering one of my favorite girls Rebecca dreamed of going to the Amazon so I figured out a way to fund her and all my local guides down in the Amazon of Peru re um, adapted the outhouse and changed out the hand so she could manage to get in and out of her little hut and stay there. And oh, it was just life changing for her to go to this dream place called the Amazon. And obviously, very positive experience for any of these students to help them achieve their dreams. That's, that's so that's so inspiring. Um, well, so now I wanted to turn to the role of trust. Um, another really important theme in your in your book. Um, in the really exciting chapter that you write about what you call the bio blitz, uh-huh. um, you discuss the importance of STEM and citizen scientists, and you write that in Malaysia and in the Amazon, you have been able to improve upon sort of foundational notions about what citizen science is and um, how you might, you know, do sort of ground truthing. Um, And I was just really impressed by the way that you um, pointed out that you put together, uh, that one of the ways you've improved upon this is by putting together these strategic uh, partnerships of Malaysian experts, for example, with international scientists. So I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about the role of trust and why it's so important not to have a top down, you know, (laughs) we're talking about the canopy. But not to have a top-down um, structure, but have a, a, a local to global, global to local, and you know, bottom-up strategy when you're putting together these kinds of partnerships. Um, you know, trust is a really great word, and I'm gr- glad you brought that up. And I think in humanities, you all probably do much better by your students talking about interpersonal behaviors and actions that lead to better success. I think in science, unfortunately, we probably don't get so much humanity and humanitarian types of suggestions and activities. And the one thing that really came home to me was my first expedition to Africa in the hot air balloon, which I talk about earlier in the book. There were 49 men and one woman, and I signed up as M. Lauman, so they wouldn't know I was female. I think they thought I was Michael, and they were horrified when I arrived. But I had to figure out how do I make myself look really brilliant and really wonderful. And the thing was trust. Uh, The pygmy villagers loved me because I had photos of my children. They loved me because I was a mom and they immediately trusted me more than they trusted a lot of my male counterparts who seemed a little more shady and threatening. So it dawned on me that being a woman in science in the field actually jumpstarts the trust if you pay attention and spend time with all the villagers. So I took that lesson with me everywhere. And of course, in places like Malaysia, where we had to quickly build up really good trust. The best way of doing that was when my international colleagues all wanted to come over and discover the new species. I said, no, wait a minute, you will partner with somebody local and then work together and that would build a bond from local to global. So it really became a good opportunity. When I worked in Ethiopia, and there's a chapter about that, I had to gain the trust of the priests to enter the last remaining forests, which are called church forests. And to do that, I had to pray a lot. I had to eat 
lamb out in the middle of the forest with them that had no hygiene and no silverware and no nothing and, you know, drink their hooch because that's what they made for these celebrations and just, you know, develop these bonds of friendship and trust. And I think when I advise students now, I say, you know, the data is really important and you need accurate data, but you can't really collect international data and work in forests in other countries without building the trust of the local people. And without that, you don't end up getting the opportunities to really have access to the trees and have the different kinds of information that you need from the shaman or the priest or whoever it is. So um, congratulations to humanities, because I think you all are ahead of science on making those kinds of attributes known to your students. Well, we have five minutes before we're going to transition to uh, student questions, if I understand that correctly. I'm getting that notice in the chat. And so that's the perfect amount of time for me to ask you the final question, which is about the citizen humanities. So in the environmental humanities, we do focus on human motivations, behaviors, and desires. So we are really interested in that. We are really interested in, in, these, um, in building trust and having culturally appropriate uh, relationships and relationships are so important. Um, and so in, in what we're calling the citizen humanities, which we're developing here at ASU, uh, we think about the ways in which students might use art and narrative to frame their data. So, so I wondered if you would be willing to sort of think of yourself as a citizen humanist in a way, because you've written this amazing, beautiful memoir. And you know that is an example of writing um, of the humanities and arts. Um, there are whole very poetic sections about your relationship to the trees, your relationship to other people you're working with. So I was wondering if you might even consider yourself to be a kind of um, environmental humanist. Doing well, Citizen Humanities. I'm really honored to have that title and it makes so much sense the way you describe it because truly we need not just citizen science where scientists get the public to help them collect data, but we need citizen humanities where we end up building this trust educating the public about important things like climate change and the importance of biodiversity and figuring out the language to do that. And I think maybe humanities could offer citizen humanities across interdisciplinary boundaries and say, let's do this with scientists. We need help, I think, in science to communicate better. I just did a very radical thing and I funded a rapper in New York City, a starving artist, and she wrote a rap called the arbor nut and it's quite brilliant and you can imagine the kids in harlem much prefer to learn about biodiversity through her rap music than maybe my scientific papers so i think if we can take you know citizen humanities to the next level and maybe asu is pioneering that maybe we could help the public understand climate change or understand why it's important to not litter plastic into the ocean and all sorts of things that are really and truly important right now, but people are overlooking them because we've maybe missed that citizen humanity approach. So I'm happy to report that UNESCO has just launched its first humanities led sustainability coalition. And Ooh. it is, um, it is hubbed at ASU in the global hey. lab. And so we have a lot to talk about. We are already sort of doing that. What That's you're great. Oh I'm my gosh. To talking to you about that. Um, Fantastic. Future. But right now we're going to turn to a student question and Courtney Caputo is going to ask you a question. Great. Hello, Dr. Lohman. Uh, my name is Courtney. Citizen scientists are an interdisciplinary group of people who likely view science from a different angle than traditional field scientists. Did you ever experience a moment when a citizen scientist's perspective helped your project in an unexpected way? If so, could you please share the story? Thank you. Absolutely. And, you know, first and foremost, citizen science is a little tricky. You can't, for example, expect citizens 
to classify and identify the scientific names of every beetle in the treetop. But you can ask them to count them, which is fantastic. Um, but I've had amazing citizen scientists who have helped me along the way. I had a group of engineers one year who volunteered and helped me map the height of the trees before we had the technology to do that. They used Coke bottles and angles and you know, they kind of knew from their engineering background how we could measure the height of some of the tall trees in the Amazon. I had another guy who couldn't believe I was using this homemade slingshot that I had welded myself in Australia from a piece of metal. So he went back to Kansas and sent me a beautiful American slingshot that had, was called a wrist rocket. And it totally allowed me to reach branches twice as high in the forest. So Along the way, I've had these fabulous people who've come into my life with their citizen knowledge and been a little entrepreneurial in helping me develop my field methods so much better from what I had originally done. In a sense, I spent half my time inventing the gadgets for canopy research. So having citizens get involved with me really jump-started and propelled a lot of those things. So that's a great question, thanks. Thank you, Courtney. Our next question is going to be by from Ruben Martinez. Hi, um, I just have one question. Um, considering just how much you care about education and how much you care about like people's interest in science, do you think your book or any books like yours should be a part of our curriculum either in high school or even in college? Do you know, I'm teaching an online college course right now with my book. It's an experiment, I guess. But in, in a sense, a lot of information about forests is hidden in the sentences. So they actually have a science textbook wrapped into the story of a person's life. So it's my hope that by perhaps taking an interest in the fate of the human, they actually learn a lot of science, they learn a lot of conservation, and maybe in a sense, it's a more effective textbook, at least that's my hope, by really fact-checking all of my, um, you know, information in the book that I'm very hopeful that it could be a textbook in a class. And it's sort of like a spoonful of sugar. If you can learn about science and policy and conservation, but you're really following the story of someone's adventures, maybe it's an easier way to learn the facts. So you help me be the judge and read the book and let me know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ruben. And our next question is from JP Hansen. Hi, Dr. Lohman, my name is JP. You study botany and arborology at the highest level, yet you are also a mother. In the Arbonaut, you explain that you typically work and study alone and with the help of your colleagues if and when the time is needed, but how did being a mother add to your understanding of life? That's a great question. Well, first of all, I was a single mom by default because I think I mentioned earlier that I married into a farming family that really forbid me to follow science. And I tried very hard to give that up for a while, but it just was part of my passion and my blood. And so I did end up being a single mom by, by choice in a way that I could have, I guess, stayed on the farm, but I came back to it. And I have to say, I was probably the happiest single mom in the country when I was teaching and juggling everything. And it was really crazy, but my kids grounded me and I feel very lucky that I was in field biology because I actually took my kids to work a lot. I had to. I couldn't leave them home or I would have gotten arrested because they'd be home alone for two weeks. And um, so they came to the jungle with me a lot. They learned to climb, but they just had such a great sense of wonder. And they saw things I didn't see or they marveled at things that I didn't appreciate. So I really turn it around and say, you know what? Maybe being a mom was an asset. It, I might not have published as fast or been quite as aggressive with my data analysis because I had to help with homework after dinner, but I think it really did give me a good perspective and it probably helped me do citizen science and engage the public a little better because I had a lot of empathy for how do you get a fifth grader excited about counting leaves all day and all these crazy things that I had to talk my kids into doing. <laughs> so thanks for asking. Thank you so much, JP. And next we'll have a question from Amy Dallenbach. Hi, Dr. Lohman. Um, 
In your book, you describe how coastal redwood trees are able to pull water all the way from the ground to the very top of the canopy. And in describing this process, you write, even more incredible is that the water moves quietly through trees and no one ever hears the gurgling of their fine-tuned machinery while walking through the woods. Our world increasingly seems filled with a clamor of voices vying for our attention. And I'm wondering how can we better posture ourselves to be receptive and responsive to these quiet wonders that the trees offer? Oh, that's such a great thought. I just hope and pray we can. Do you know, Amy, that less than 5% of Americans have ever even seen a redwood? But it is the most iconic tree in North America. I promise you more people have been to Disney, of course, than have ever seen a redwood. So we really have to turn that around. And it has to come through perhaps writing, through storytelling, through creating adventure and excitement. Um, I'm really happy to announce that we have a new canopy walkway up in Eureka, California through the Redwoods. And I hope that will excite people a little bit. Um, and it's hard to find silent places to be. The forest is usually full of noisy birds and wonderful things, but it's certainly not full of water gurgling through the trees. So maybe you can help me. Maybe in the humanities, we can think of ways for you all to write or create media that would help the world of science make it more sexy and exciting for people to seek nature. Because I do think that it's a lot for, it's good for health. It's good for emotion. It's good for all sorts of things to help kids do better. So we really need to work together to figure out some good ideas. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And we have one final student question, which I'm going to read. And that question is, as you return virtually to Arizona, what is something that you've learned from the local ecosystem here? And how might we learn from the wonders of the desert? Oh, how great. Well, I was just in Antarctica too. Talk about a desert, an ice desert, where believe it or not, even in those crazy places that look like there's not too much activity, there's a whole lot. And of course, I was sampling water bears in Antarctica because they live in the moss and the lichens of even the most frozen places. So you have a place in your backyard where people do have to learn to use their five senses. They have to smell and look closely and see an extraordinary horizon and appreciate the amazing resource of water, which might appear to be in short supply, but in actual fact, the plants are adapted to it and the birds and everything else. So I think you all have what I call an extreme environment, but the canopy is also an extreme environment where after it rains, the water is in short supply. When the sun beats down on the leaves at the top of a 300 foot tall tree, it's not unlike a desert. And believe it or not, a lot of cactus live in the forest canopy. So maybe we have more similarities than differences. So when I go to the desert, I always try to think about how those plants might be a lot similar to my very tallest of trees. So thanks for asking. Um, okay, here's a here's an audience question. Um, hi, Dr. Loman. My name is Brian, and I am from Malaysia. You caught my attention when you mentioned that you had been to Malaysia to discover new tree species. May I know what tree species did you discover and you and your team discover? Oh my gosh. Well, please read the chapter in my book about Malaysia. I hope you enjoy it. But I was an advisor to a park outside of Penang where they really, really wanted to save the forest instead of letting it go to palm oil. So we had a bio blitz. We created a beautiful canopy walkway. It's one of my favorites in the world. And we put up a nomination for the world heritage um, status of a UNESCO biological reserve and it succeeded just this year. So we're really excited. No new tree species per se, but new records of dipterocarps, which is a very important family of trees in the Asian area, and some new species of water bears, some new species of spiders and other things. But everyone is still working on a lot of the information they collected there. So if you get to go to Penang, please go up the hill and um, see our amazing canopy walkway, and you will just love it. So thanks for asking about that. I will confirm that that chapter on Malaysia is so exciting and fun to read. 
Now we have another uh, really interesting question from the audience. And this question is, instead of anthropomorphizing our interactions with nature, how can we as citizens best dendrochronologize our society and social interactions? I love that. I love that word. Can I coin it and use it? It's yeah. Great. Because, you know, people get inspired by trees. I certainly do. So I'm very prejudiced, but I think everyone can, you know, trees nurture other organisms. They share water, they shade, they provide incredible services. What else gives us oxygen and of course makes energy from sunlight and provides us with medicines and things like chocolate and cherries and oranges and all kinds of cool stuff. So I think we really should do that. And they are so spiritual. I work now, of course, in India and I work in Ethiopia, places where trees are such a spiritual heritage. So let's do that. Let's definitely um, use that wonderful word, dendrochronogize, however we say it. And um, it would be so great. And uh, I did a talk recently with this Japanese guy that invented forest bathing. And in a lot of countries, you know, they're really taking to the woods after. COVID for some kind of spiritual rejuvenation. You may not be able to do that in the desert, but we can certainly use any trees and any cactus or some wonderful green, you know, plants that we can be um, kind of emotionally and spiritually inspired by. So I hope you'll all take to the trees. I'm going to say that word one more time, just because we all need to memorize it. <laughs> Chronogize. <laughs> Dendra chronogize. I right. love it. Dendra chronogize. I love that question. All right, here's another audience question. How did you stay motivated through all the doubts? And how did you have the persistence when you had never even seen a, a female scientist? I cried a lot. I must admit, it wasn't always so easy to stay motivated. A lot of that inspiration came from my kids because I as I worked more and more on conservation, I knew I had to do that for my children, despite the hurdles and the odds. But there were definitely moments when it was hard to stay motivated. And I guess I'm a lover of nature. I take solace in nature. So the trees also inspired me as well as my children. Great question. Another audience uh, question. If there's time, um, where, where was your favorite country to visit throughout your travels and why? Oh, great question. And I do a lot of talks to middle schools because there's the, a children's book that's been written about me and they have it in the curriculum for about 30 states. And every kid asks me that question, which is so cute. And I always kind of cheat and I say two things. I love Australia because that's where I pioneered climbing and canopy access, both the rope methods and the canopy walkways were pioneered in Australia. But if I were to wave a magic wand and take all of you somewhere right now, I would definitely take you to the upper Amazon, which is the Peruvian half of the Amazon. Brazil is getting absolutely massacred, of course, because the logging barges come up river from the mouth and a lot of fires and a lot of destruction is going on there. But 2000 miles from the mouth of the Amazon is the upper Amazon in Peru, which is still much more pristine. And that's where I would take you. We have a fabulous canopy walkway there. We have sloths and 13 species of monkeys. And that's of course where I take the citizen science expeditions because it's just so life-changing for people who may not ever understand a rainforest unless they see it firsthand. So um, I'll just tell you that we do have a global network of environmental humanists doing citizen humanities work. And one of our, in our South American observatory hub is in Iquitos. Oh my gosh. Yes, well, then so we need a field trip. Oh my yeah, gosh. Field trip. <laughs> okay, here's another question. I've heard the term community scientist instead of citizen scientist to be more inclusive for those, for those who may not be citizens of a country. Um, do you have any thoughts about the term community scientist? Instead right. Of I love that. And I've heard that given as a conversation, and I think it's an important conversation. I guess my definition of citizen is we are all citizens of nature and we're all citizens of the world. So I never 
find that term limiting to anybody. And I certainly have worked with my fair share of people who might not be citizens of the country where we're working. But if the word community feels better and is more inclusive, there is nothing wrong with that either. Basically, there it's an elevated version of volunteering in science that we as scientists so appreciate. So I call them heroes, citizen heroes. Anyone who's willing to come out with me and count bugs and measure leaves has to be a hero as well as a citizen or a community member. So I thank all of the people who volunteer in our world of science. Here's another question from the audience. What piece of advice do you wish um, you had been given as a young woman in STEM and furthermore in the field of sustainability? Oh, great question. First and foremost, I always wish someone had told me, be bold and brave. I was so shy. I never raised my hand. When I was told that I couldn't take the geology major at my college, I just tiptoed off and switched majors. I never realized that I should have spoken up and tried to fix things at the time. So that would be my number one advice, be strong and bold. And my number two piece of advice to women, now that there are more women majoring in science, I would say, please support each other. Be helpful, be the mentor and the role model for each other. Don't necessarily compete, but be partners and friends in science. I'm really jealous because I used to have to run home after work and make dinner for my kids and help them with their homework. But all my male counterparts would go to the pub or they'd go play golf on the weekend or do some male bonding. And I think my generation of women missed out on that. And so I hope women can support other women in really positive ways. Uh, and I would say your, uh, your book is just such an inspiration for women in academia, not just in science, but women in academia in general. So oh, thanks. Um, we've reached the end of our time, unfortunately. This has been such a great set of questions from our students and from the audience members. And I want to thank everyone who asked um, these great questions. We also want to thank Dean Jeffrey Cohen for his support uh, tonight. And we want to especially thank Kristen LaRue and Bruce Matsunage for organizing this event and the Zoom uh, technology. Additional thanks to Peter Jansen and Byron Echeverria from Macmillan Publishers. And finally, we want to thank all of our incredible ASU writing teachers who work tirelessly to help ASU students imagine a brighter future. And finally, Dr. Meg Lohman, we want to thank you for coming and spending time with us tonight and for inspiring, I would argue, science, women scientists representations in film, um, in literature, and, and in pop culture with the Barbies and the Legos. Um, so thank you so much for, for your time. And we're just really, really um, honored and it's such a pleasure to read your book. Oh, well, thank you for having me. And I'm glad we're finished because you'll notice it's getting dark. I didn't turn the light off in my office. So my face is suddenly becoming nocturnal, but I can't <laughs> reach the light switch from my computer. <laughs> so this was perfect. And, and I really appreciate the chance to share things with your students. Enjoy the book and send me any more questions anytime. I'm always happy to talk about trees and women in science and writing, which are great, great topics. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who came tonight.